Welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. Here is my column. They say he is sick, yet he's the one showing a dynamo of energy. He had a surgery, nothing new in any man's life. Some worry, and that's legitimate. We have had persons in the top tier who did not show capacity of action because of poor physical being. But Ashuaju Bola Tinubu threw the challenge last week. He said people say he is not well, but he undertook the long walk in Mecca during the Hajj. He's the one conquering miles in the country, from palaces to big hall podiums to government houses, from Abuja to Oyo, to Gombe to Kaduna, to Abeokuta to Niger. He once took a drive from Sokoto to Zamfara at night. He's the one hopping in and out of planes, in and out of cars, in and out of halls, glad handing, hogging, meeting till late at night. Where are the others? What is their itinerary? So he challenges his critics, where is their health certificate? He's not like the others who are cell phone candidates. As count in Abuja or their villages waiting to be announced the anointed ones. They are the baboons waiting for the born. But the people will say babu to such opportunism. It is the Nigerian disease of reaping where no one sows. The same thing that made President Buhari to say at the party convention that no candidate should be imposed. It's the impunity of indolence. What my teacher at Ife, Professor Gigi Dara, called the agro bourgeoisie. Who get paid for passengers they did not get? Ashuwaju is like the lines in the ballad of St. Andrews. Fight on, my man, says Sir Andrew Batten. I am hurt, but I am not slain. I will lay me down and bleed a while. And then I will rise and fight again. That's the spirit we're seeing in the Lion of Bodilon. Others will do well to aid. We are tech in Nigeria. So the pleasure have never been before. Welcome to Big Talk. I have a very special guest today. Is none other than Dr. Yemi Ogumbi, who is a man of many parts, and uh, it needs no introduction, but uh, I would just say Yemi Ogumbi is a man of letters, a man of the media, a man of public relations, and a public intellectual. You're welcome to this show, sir. Thank you very much, Sam. You have written a very interesting tome of a book uh, going through your life from childhood to only oh, recently, exactly. And uh, in the first place, why did you decide to write this? Well, Sam, thank you for asking me. To, uh, if you read the book, and I'm sure you have read the book, you would have noticed that in the epilogue, I state clearly why I wrote the book. I knew from when I was a child that mine was an unusual kind of life. Mm. Here was I, born by an Igbo mother in Kanu, to Yoruba father. And I started my life speaking only Hausa and my mother's version of Igbo language. And yet, my hair was, uh, as growing up, my name, of course, at the time was Ifani, which right. was my mom's name. And yes. my, my mom uh, gave me that name. And everybody coming by the name, if I won't be in Kano, it was an unusual kind of situation. Mm. But once I moved from Kano to the south of Nigeria to go to high school, mm. I knew that mine was an unusual kind of life. And I had that serious problem of self-identity. Mm. And I said to myself, this story has to be told at some point. I knew at that point that at some point in my life, mm. I'll have to tell that story of my life. And so I was inspired to write this from a number of reasons. My children needed to also know where, I, where it all started, how it, how it happened, where I came from. And so it becomes, in some ways, a book about self-identity. Hmm. Becomes, on a different level, a book about our country's history, our country's evolution, from when I grew up as a child in Kano, 
and then saw Nigeria grow from what it was in the for late 40s to what it became, you know, uh, as I went through university mm -hmm. and I came back to work in the media industry. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, that inspired this work, to tell that story and to refocus, you know, uh, that perspective so that younger people coming after me would learn what Nigeria was like when I was growing up as a child. It's important for us to state these things for the record. Mm. Younger people can learn from them. Mm. Our country was not always like this. Mm. I mean, it wasn't a country where a Deborah was killed in Sokoto mm. because she said, Jesus help me. Yes. Without saying, I mean, it wasn't like that. I grew up in Kano as a child. Mm. I, in in Igbo Inon school, there were a few guys from the city mm. who were Northerners who were in school with us yeah. at Igbo Inon school. Mm. It wasn't always like this. Mm. So it's important for people to know that we, where we came from, my own generation, and of course, that I where we're heading. I think service in Gorondusse, that's what I was Gorondusse, okay, so that's it. So, that's why I lived in one year. So it's a terrible thing, and, mm. and I'm glad that, and I hope more people can write their own uh, accounts like this. It, it leads, it contributes more. Look, Professor Shenka said something at the book launch when he said that, I filled up some, I filled in some gaps for him. Yes. Some things he didn't know. No, for Shunka to say that, that's something that's big. Mm -hmm. That some things I said here filled in certain gaps for him. Mm -hmm. That's important. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So this thing should be written about yeah. and we should glorify that kind of past. Mm -hmm. My father's house, look, the, the late of Kano, Adubayero, was always in my father's house. Yes. They had lovely sessions there. Yeah. Maji Agwe, who is now in, um, in Kano, is in his 80s, is in his 80s, they would come there, they would sit. With, um, I first met a man in Kano in my father's house. Yes, we're, we're little, I was a little boy. He came there, there were you know, other big names. Who were, my father's house was a small house, mm -hmm. but it was a beehive of activities. Everybody came there. Yeah. <laughs> now, that, that past is gone. Yeah. Uh, because as I say in my epilogue, we have to refocus our country. And one way to begin to do so, in my view, is for us to begin to read accounts like mine. Where they are unique. They are not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not special, I'm not alone. There are other Nigerians like me who would have similar backgrounds like mine and similar stories like my own to tell. They should tell those stories mm -hmm. because those stories help to rebuild our country. Mm -hmm. Younger people who do not know about that kind of past would read my book, learn from it, and say to themselves, well, if we were there at some point, why can't we be there today? Mm -hmm. So uh, to go back to your question, that's why I wrote this book, to retell that story and in the, in the process of doing so, to refocus our country for the future. Looking at your childhood in Kano, it was very fascinating. You went to a school that was supposed to be mainly Igbo. Your yes, father, it was Igbo Union School, yeah, it was called, yes, school. yes. Your, your father, Yoruba, he tended to be mostly in the background, but then somehow it was also in the foreground because, because it, 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 it was involved in making sure that you had a sense of what kind of business it was doing. It was a, what you call fashion designer yes, today. Yes, yes. And so it reminds me of the story of uh, the late governor, Ajima Biu, whose father was also okay, like that okay, and so on. Okay. I will come to I will come to that, but what fascinates me also in your background there yes. is the is is something I wanted to see that I didn't see. How was the relationship between your Yoruba father and your Igbo mother yes. in the house? Was there any kind of inter language or intercultural conflict that had to rub off on you? Oh, yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, very good question, Sam, yes. Yeah. That happened uh, in several ways. But we, kids, children can, can manage conflicting situations mm. far, more than, far better than adults. Mm. I'll give an example of what you're saying. Um, in Igbo culture, if you, if you are given a meal, mm. after you eat, you go back and say, thank you, ma. Mm. Now, Europeans hate that. They don't, it's against Yoruba culture. Mm -hmm. So here we were, and uh, we knew that it was wanted you to, after you had a meal, normal eating at home, you yeah. say, thank you, ma. Like, it was not do it, and Europe doesn't do it. Yeah. It's an abomination, you don't mm -hmm. go that way. So we learned early, and uh, my mom made sure, she kept on reminding us that, don't do it because Europeans don't do it. Mm -hmm. So she, at the beginning, mm -hmm. had us 
position in such a way that we remembered, we knew from day one that we were Yorubas. Mm. Although uh, she was not one, it was not Yoruba, but she, she tried to Yorubanize, to Yorubanize herself. She became, Mama spoke the language with a very bad accent, of course, yes. But she tried to remind us again and again, which is why she insisted yeah, that I should go to school. So she was the one that said, no, you don't belong here. You're not in Hausa, you're not Igbo. You yeah. must go back to school in the mm, south, south, in Yoruba speaking area. Yeah. So she knew from the one that with a last name like your own, mm. you're, not, you're not from here. And so she made every attempt to remind us again and again. And so there was no conflict at all. Mm. Um, but which is something, there's something ironic in what you just asked, uh, asked me. My father, by contrast, mm -hmm. my father had something, uh, as a man who was a tailor, mm. he, he made, as a fashion designer, as you put it, yeah. he also felt that Igbos didn't have a good sense of fashion. And would I would make sneaking remarks about it was so they were his where is uh where is um where is uh clients and they would say, Yeah, you know, these boys they don't understand how to wear a nice suit. And I used to say to myself, But you're married to wife. <laughs> so I said, Your wife is not your so why do you so he said, But Yorubans have a better sense of how to look when you wear a suit. But the boys they don't understand it. And he said it with so much. So I used to say, as I go to I said, Well, if your wife uh is uh, is Igbo, why were you making this niggas demands about 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 uh, Igbos? <laughs> so so but in terms of that conflict, no. We mm -hmm. we went through our lives. And kids, children can also pick up look, as growing up as a child, I would start a sentence in Yoruba yeah. and bring in Igbo words and in outside words. <laughs> and I would I would say Bikonyem Kose Kose Zakara. Yes. Uh, Bikonyem Kose uh, dear. Yeah. Yes, it's Hausa. Because <laughs> Kose. So it, we say, and people will laugh at us. But we didn't realize what we were doing. So what we're doing was we we're processing different languages language, at the same time uh, yes. simultaneously. And and that happened a lot. We will say something like, um, uh, uh, you know, anything in a sentence that yeah. would have a Nibo word, yes. Yoruba word, word. And, and, and the Hausa word, and we got away with it. No, in terms of that uh, cultural conflict, no, it didn't happen. But the point I think I didn't make. I didn't make in the book in terms of uh, coming across. I didn't explain as deeply as I thought I should have explained the crisis of self-identity. Mm -hmm. It's very deep. In, yes. Self-identity is very deep. It's not something is ethno-religious. It's very it's very complex. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not sure that I conveyed it well. You in the conveyed book. it when you got to Ibadan. Ibadan. Okay. All it right. It was so. It was so. I couldn't speak it the was language. So well, because yes. you couldn't speak the language. I was lost. You were trying to devour the culture. Yes, yes, it precisely. It was such a des just a desperate Apparently. moment of yes. like. So, so that's why that's that's why I, I wondered. Did your father ever worry about that? It seems like it was no, he didn't. That worried no, it didn't. It was my mom. <laughs> I don't. Care. And that's why I say in the book that my mom was the one. She set the rules. Yes. She said which school I would go to. Yes. I went to Igbo Union School because it was the closest school to the house. Yeah. And my uncle, Mama's youngest brother, had mm. gone to the school and had done so well. That's lying. No, 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 no it's my younger brother. Younger my brother, mom's yeah. youngest brother, oh, your uncle, uncle Augustine, Augustine, had yes, gone to, to Igbo Union School. And I excelled, and I excelled there. Mm. And so as far as Mama was concerned, it was a good school. Mm. Just take him to a school that I used to the house. Mm. It didn't matter whether it was Igbo Union School or mm. the Holy Trinity, which was Yoruba School, yeah. or the Catholic School, which was yeah. where uh, yeah. my, my late friend Tony Kazaba went to, yes. or Baptist School. Yeah. What was important was get him to the Nare School. And since it was Igbo Union School, so be it. Mm. So she laid the rules. Mm. She, Mama decided what clothes we would wear, mm. what church we attended, you know, what uh, shoes we, we had to wear. So Papa was more of a big time socialite. Yes. And I'm not sure I was saying anything different from most, most children my age at that time. Most of our fathers were distant. They, 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 were, they, were, they appeared distant. Yes. But my father was. When I went back and read the book, I thought I was being a little bit hard on him. Yes, yeah, you, you because if, come to that. If yes. at age one, he took me into a studio, mm. we posed for a photograph, and he did it again at age five. Yeah. Then obviously, it meant a lot to him. So if he if he didn't show that kind of uh, because at one stage at the time he was um, he was he was going to be buried, you kind of gave the impression that you're not too close to this man. No, no, and no. You kind I, of no. saw him as a kind of a hard man. No, you know, no, something no. Like that. I I think 
I think I, 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 in the but first then, draft, then you try to nuance it. The yeah. first draft of this book was a little bit harder on him. And I yeah. then said to myself, even as a father, how close have I been to my own children? Yeah. Once you begin to think that way, then you think, and I thought, man, wait a minute, I'm, I think I'm being hard on this man. Uh, but he was a lovely man, a mm -hmm. lovely father, and I, I enjoyed the benefits of it. He was so proud of us, mm -hmm. like myself, and, and, and used to boast to his friends that this should I going to become something big someday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember when I when I was appointed to Daily Times mm -hmm. and Baba Jose, uh, uh, I went to see him and he said, oh my goodness, how I wish Father Danny was alive to see this today. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't see that, but he had also predicted that I would go into bigger things in mm -hmm. life beyond um, what he saw when he was alive. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, yes, I, I balanced it and yeah. he was a fantastic father. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this is something that I suppose all fathers should also think of. Yes. If you make that kind of judgment of your own parents, yeah. always say to yourself, have, look, I, have, have, I, been have I been, been, a, been a good bit. parent? Have I been, how close have I been to my own children? Exactly. Once you make that kind of judgment, you'll be amazed at you know, how hard you would have been on your parents. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's yeah. what happened. Yeah. Then, when he had any clothes, you used to order clothes from the yes. UK, had yes. A, yes. an arrangement, and then you will go to the, the post, office. post office. Yes. You get your clothes back, yes. and then they will arrange them neatly. Yes. And will be so proud of yes. the clothes, and they yes. always fit, and yes. so on. Many people see you as a man who takes, who pays a lot of attention to your suits. This has been <laughs> a story for a long time. Okay. That this man always dresses well. But when I read it, I said, oh, so this you is where it came from. Came from. <laughs> but you never made any reflection no, on that in the book. I didn't. No, I, I think you're right, <laughs> Sam. I think my father's uh, business as a fashion person yeah. affected us. It, it mm. obviously had a lot of influence. Mm. I'll tell you a story that was very moving. When he was dying, mm. I went to see him. I was at the Guardian newspapers. I'd gone to see him in hospital at Solary. Yeah. yeah. And when I walked in there, mm. I had a double-breasted uh, jacket and a gray trousers. Mm. And I had a red tie with a, with a, in a blue shirt, a blue shirt. And my father always felt that if you wore a double-breasted suit, blue, and then your gray trousers, you should wear a blue, something bluish kind of tie. Bring it up. But that the red was an American influence on me. <laughs> and so when I sat by his, uh, I, he was lying on the, you know, on, on the bed. So he said, I put me, waved to me to come closer to him. And I moved on to him. And he pulled me closer and said, he adjusted my tie. And looked down at me and said, well, you look nice, but I don't like your red tie. And I said, well, that, that's, that's American. I said, yes, I know, that's not nice. You should wear something that's like blue on it. He died the next day. Really? Yes, we went, once I left him that day, went to come and died. But there he was on his deathbed. He pulled me across to himself and said to me, and I walked up to him and said, I, I thought he was going to whisper to me. So he adjusted my tie. He said my tie was slightly needed adjustment. And they looked down to see what I was wearing and said, well, you look nice. He said, but I don't like the red tie. And I said, well, that's American. I said, I know. Now, now that's somebody who was dying. Yeah, was looking at what I was wearing. <laughs> so, so he was, he was very particular. But he came to see me once. Uh, and I said it in the book, he came to see me once in the battle. And, uh, and I think he said to me that I was wearing something that was very loud. He said, my, with some red trousers. He said, come on, you can't dress like that. That's not nice. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, Papa, this is not, this is, uh, this, I'm 20, 21 years old. <laughs> so, but he was very particular about those things. Yeah. And if you look at the photograph of me when I was at the back of the book, yeah. uh, this photograph here, yeah. he made this suit for me. Really? In, yeah, he made this suit for us. And you can see double-breasted yes, kind double of jacket. Breasted, yes. And that's the way we were dressed up as kids. And he wanted to make sure we, were, we looked very nice and all that. So you're right. I mean, I obviously, yeah, I, and if you notice, when I go around, when I put on anything I wear, I have a pen. Mm. He once told me a story. He said to me, when you go, when you go for Masonic meetings, it was, it was a very good mason. Yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah. you must carry a pen. I said, why do you take a pen for a Masonic meeting? It's because you have to sign documents at Masonic meetings. So a gentleman must carry with him a pen. <laughs> and I said, why? Well, so um, if you notice, yes, anyway, yes, I go, I carry yes, a pen with yes, him. Yes. Um, so Olos is, of course, Rob Ruffin on, yes. on my brother and I. And we, we learned so much from him in terms of, uh, and he was particular about dressing. Yes. My dad said, if you wear a black blazer, your trousers must be gray. It's it, 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 our rules. Yes. And then he had a, he had a whole wardrobe of shirts. And as I said in the book, 
or still yeah. read. Yeah. Those shirts, I remember them, yeah. Yeah. but most of them were white shirts. And so a few blue shirts, but usually Austin Reed shirts. Yeah. And it threw the house of ties and jackets. And some of them he used for his business. So if you mm -hmm. came for a measurement and you didn't have a jacket on, he gave you one to try on because then the jacket gave him a, a proper view of measurement for you. Yeah. And so, yes, I, I think you're right in saying that that rubbed off on us. Now, your mother is from Pia Boy. Yes, from, Mama, yeah, Mama, Mama was, Mama was Kwale from Kwale, Abo, yes. but she also had relationships from uh, uh, Obaru Onecha. Yes. yes yeah. So that, my, for instance, something I didn't say in the book. My mom was a distant relation of Chike Obi. Really? Chike Obi was Obaru, mm -hmm. uh, half Obaru, half mm -hmm. Onecha. But mm -hmm. Mama was. I didn't mention in the book. Yeah. How did I know this? Chike Obi came to Kanu, came to the house. I was very, she and Mama going to a long conversation. And then when, when he left, after I left, Mama said to us that we were related. I said, how? And Mama then, then explained to me that some of her relations are Gwaru. Some, of course, are from Abo. Okay. But, um, but she lived in Onicha, most of her. Yes, the house she owned was in Fege Layout in Onicha, number three, Creek Road, okay. Fege Layout, okay. which she owned and built Fege, it. Yeah. Yes, yes. Fege, yes, she, that, yeah. At that time, yeah. when she built the house, mm -hmm. Fege was just opening up. Okay. Was a, was a uh, new estate at that time? Yeah. Yes. Now, when you were in Bad in the Badon, yes. Nigeria got into this uh, uh, crisis. The, Which one? The, the, the Nigerian crisis. Oh, the civil war. The civil, civil okay. War. Civil war. Your mom being Igbo, I wanted to know what happened during the pogrom. Where was she? She was. What in, was what was your anxiety about your mom? Very good at question. That time? Very good yes. question. My mom was almost killed in, in Ikeja. Wow, here yes, in yes, in the Kedja. It happened to my father too, even yes. though it looked, it, it was, uh, she was, it was the Robo, it was Shekiri. Yes. He, he had to, he, he had to get a Robo man to save him because he said he looked like an evil man. Yes, my mother was almost killed. They knew she was evil, but everybody called her Mama Ibo yeah. in the Kedja. Yeah. So when the, when the killing started, they came, mm -hmm. they were looking for somebody else. They were looking for Gogon Zerebe, who was mm -hmm. living around the Kedja by the house. Yes. And they went knocking on doors. And somebody had told them that there's a neighbor woman living there who mm. sold. Uh, Mama mm. was a distributor for drinks. Mm. And they got there, they tried to, and then she came out and uh, someone said, oh, no, 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 she's Mrs. Ogumbi. Mm. And that may have saved her. Mm. But I was, yeah, but she's, uh, they said, no, 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 she's married to Yoruba man. She's Yoruba, she's not a uh, neighbor. But her life was, she was, uh, I didn't say it in the book. It wasn't some, well, I suppose looking back now, it could have, they could have killed her, but mm. you know, I didn't, Think it was something I should um, I should have spent some time. On. She was almost killed in the Kenya mm -hmm. at that time. It was tough for her. What happened was that before the what we call Aware, Aware is yes. let you know before it started in the north, Mama had left to come and stay in Lagos. Okay. She first she went to Onitsha and then came back just in time before the yes. before the uh, civil war started yes. and bought herself this house in the Kenya mm. and was living there when it was the, Papa. Papa was it was in Kanu. Okay. He stayed back, he stayed back in Kanu. Mm -hmm. And as I say in the book, he was almost killed also because he hid some Igbos in his house. In oh, yes, Kanu. yes, you said so. And, yes. and they came no one they day. Somebody and, what somebody gave uh, it was a tip off that yes, they were hiding yes, Igbos yes. and he denied it. And these drunken soldiers came to, to yes. search his house. Yes. And he said you can search. But they were hidden in rooftops somewhere, hidden somewhere. And yeah. and he was again almost killed. Yeah. The guy was who almost cocked his gun was was drunk. Somebody said, ah, don't you know him? He's mm -hmm. Baba Gumbi, he's been there for God knows how many years. Mm -hmm. And that's what saved him. Mm -hmm. So it was a tough time for just about everyone. And as mm -hmm. you rightly said, your own, your own father. It, it was people got killed mm -hmm. who had nothing to do with the East or with, with, yeah. with, uh, with the Igbo yes, or something. Okay. But it was, it was a terrible time. A terrible time. Well, you, you we move from that to your time as... Uh, as a student, yes, and your life, the life as a student took different forms. You know, you were in Ibadan, yes, into King's College, yes, where you met some people. You met Stanley. Um, Stanley people. came to teach. Yeah, Stanley was people. taught my class. Yes, yes. Then you also had a, 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 a schoolmate in a BJ, Biodu. Oh, BJ, yes, yes, and, yes, and yes, yes. absolutely, yes. And then there was also the story of your. Your meeting with Wale Shoinka and uh, and uh, how eventually you had this uh, this wine encounter. Can you tell <laughs> us something about? <laughs> no, that was that was Shoinka had just been released from prison. Yes, and we all went to see him. I had gone to. It's interesting. When I was in Canon holidays, my first year in Ibadan, 
68 session, 69 session. No, 67, 68 session. Mm. So I went to Kano, I went to spend the summer in my, with my father in Kano. Mm. And I went to the Kaduna prisons to see if I could see. Shoenka was moved from Kirikiri to Kaduna briefly. I wasn't allowed to see him. I was taken there by uh, my father's good friend, a very good lawyer in Kano at the time, Aindet Thani. And Majagwe, a prominent lawyer now who's in his uh, 80s, was working with Majagwe at the time. Anyway, so I didn't see him. And then when he was released from prison, I was now in my first year at Ibadan. Uh, Here is my poem in the series, The Politician. I spoke, they knew, internet wrote and set me a blow. How can I parry the blow and keep alive my show as it has gone viral to sweeten my rival? No, 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 I should not let it go. I have to wipe it from all memory. If internet always remembers, then I might expire in its embers. How can I amass powers toward its time? But can that scan me from my scandal? Unless I am like God above time. Thank you for being on this show. You can join my column at www.samomashe.com and on Twitter at Samomashe. And until next time, be good.